connectivity is an end-to-end -end problem and open source connectivity is broken down into three sub-foundations, LF connectivity, LF edge, and LF networking. And they all solve one single critical infrastructure problem is how do you connect people, how do you connect things, how do you connect globally, and how do you connect with open source. And so today I'm gonna to talk about a few very interesting announcements in the world of networking uh, that we just announced at the Open Source Summit. Hi, this is your host, Apni Bhartia, and we are here at Open Source Summit in Bilbao, Spain. And today we have with us, once again, Arpit Joshipura, GM of Networking Edge IoT and Energy at Linux Foundation. Arpit, once again, it's great to have you on the show. Great to be here. Yeah, and of course, this is an exciting, of course, we can see behind us, great venue, Linux Foundation. You folks always pick great venues, though it's sometimes it's hard to reach there, but there are great venues and great turnout, great audience. Talk a bit about this is first day of the event. Uh, what kind of audience, what kind of turnout you saw here? First of all, um, I agree with you. It's a great place, great venue, and you know our events team just puts up a fantastic show. So uh, what I can say, though, that uh, doing my keynote from the stage and looking at the audience, almost everybody had cameras up when I was speaking. So that felt good. Uh, a full house, obviously. Uh, but because of the content and because of the people that come to the events, it's really very exciting, especially with this one-on-one -on -one engagement in person, finally, after a long three years. So you're happy to see cameras because you know, they are covering all the networking. Cameras are all about networking. They're all about edge. They're all about IoT. That's why you're like, hey, this is my audience, right? This is my audience. <laughs> this is... They, and they are consuming my projects. Exactly. <laughs> yes. now, now let's talk a bit about uh, some announcement that came out because you wear so many hats, you led so many you know, projects there. So we made three major announcements today. Uh, the first announcement was on uh, a project called uh, Kamara. Uh, Kamara is, uh, is, is a global project that uh, exposes the APIs. APIs stand for Application Programming Interface. So basically you are trying to get access into the network, the telco network, but then develop app on, apps on top so that you can monetize that. So that we announced that project as a directed fund or um, a, a funded project so that we can scale. So that was one. Um, Deutsche Telekom uh, led the project and, and they were here on stage with me to announce it. Uh, the second announcement was on a very interesting project which is called Silva, which, is, uh, which was formed and launched as an LF EU project. Its influence is global, obviously, but it does include a lot of, in, uh, lot of interaction with uh, uh, LF networking projects like Anuket, and it includes requirements from Europe that needs to be customized for European agencies or EUs. Uh, so that project is, is, is a cloud-native uh, implementation of a telco stack that is built on reference models and reference architectures that LFN's Anuket provides. Uh, so that was, again, led by Orange and uh, joined me on the stage for announcing. And then the third announcement was uh, we expanded our partnership we as in LF Networking, expanded our partnership with Etsy. And Etsy, so if you remember five years ago, we did a video on you know, harmonizing standards and open source. And if Etsy has a standard, we would implement it. If, we, if they don't have a standard, we would code it and then have uh, a standard created on that. So we were able to uh, expand the partnership to include some very innovative projects like Nephew and Kamara, as an example. I want to just briefly talk about Kamara. I talked to Marcus earlier, but I heard a lot of uh, repeatedly about uh, kind of how to monetize, how to commercialize. And when we look at open source, you know, it is seen as two different words. Commercial word is different than open, but that is not reality. Without commercialization, open source will not succeed. It will not survive. If you look at these events or if you look at these projects, I mean, Linux Foundation actually paved the path 
for corporate players to become good open source citizens. And that is why it's sustainable. That is why you see so much growth of that because right. we need that model. So can you talk about the importance of that? And then once again, the Kamara project there. You're asking two separate questions. There is a there's a monetization or a commercialization of open source project in general. And I agree with you completely. We have paid the way of making uh, what I call the plumbing layer uh, of software common, right? Non-differentiated software. It's all common. And then companies, when vendors, members, system integrators on top, uh, they differentiate and then they sell it as a product, support it, charge money for it, and they make money out of it. And that's the cycle that we support. And I think it's a proven cycle now. The second question on monetizing through Kamara is a different kind of monetization. What it is, network is full of rich data. Okay, rich data, right? Where phones are, what information exists, and they are the trusted partners. That data is not sold, right? They are not, right? But if you have APIs that you can provide services based on that data without necessarily pushing it out, uh, then you can write applications on top. I think of this as an app store for the network. Like it could be some charging functions or it could be, uh, you know, you are in a crowded uh, area and you need bandwidth on demand or lat low latency on demand, right? Things like that. Uh, and then you can upsell those services. So that's kind of what Kamara is intending to do. And it's a different kind of monetization than the, the previous one. Networking and energy is the highways. If the power goes down, it doesn't really, your word comes to the same as with networking as well, you know, connectivity. And if you look at EVs or any other, you know, generative AI, chat GPT, talk a bit about the role of networking Note of careers, telcos in modern, because it's going to play even more critical role as we are getting connected. And then let's talk about the role that LF networking is playing there. So let's first address the LF networking and LF energy question. Uh, both of these are critical infrastructures. Okay, U.S. government, EU, right? Everybody understands that it's critical infrastructure because if either energy grid or network connectivity goes down businesses countries you know they right so given that this is critical infrastructure how do you secure it how do you operate it how do you protect it right is is a high priority right for both organizations the other thing i can tell you is lf energy and the energy grid is following the footsteps of networking so 5 years ago proprietary infrastructure, proprietary solutions, right? Uh, very regulated industry, very standards-based. Same thing like net telecom. Telecom moved to an open source world now, fully disaggregated, SDN, right? Everything is there. Energy is the same. So LF Energy is paving the way to do exactly what uh, telecom did. And more importantly, they're also collaborating with LF Edge through common projects like Fledge, right, where they can use that project and their use case for the energy grid, right, at the edge of the energy grids. Uh, so they are doing, um, so, so, so there's a lot of commonality in terms of lessons learned, architecture, software solutions, uh, standards, and, and, and the behavior, right, that we are sharing as best practices. That's why kind of I'm running kind of that, the, the umbrellas. That, that's one. The second question on AI and how it is important is I want to make it extremely clear that we have four layers in AI. There is a infrastructure layer, which is the network, and there's tremendous amount of data that comes out from the network, right? Just we talked about that. Uh, but then what you do with the data has two parts. One is the data governance. How do you share the data? And you need to share it in a public setting or you can share it in a private setting, right? Which I call domain specific AI. And then there is the AI infrastructure 
the GPUs that you run the models on, machine learning models on. That has both a centralized generic thing like ChatGPT, central, general public domain, and then there's domain specific, whether it's the energy domain or the telecom domain, right? So we are, LF networking is focusing on the te tele telecom specific domain AI, both data sharing and the models. And then on top, you have the use cases. And the use cases are extremely custom for the domains, right? Um, customer billing or customer uh, support or uh, federated learning or, uh, you know, there, there's about 10 use cases that our, gen our governing board has identified. And our governing board, LF networking, 80% of the top 10 CapEx spenders are in the community, right? So we as a community are deciding what the top 10 use cases are and that's what we're gonna fo focus on. And these are domain specific AI use cases, right? Doesn't, it, so it's not chat GPT, it is domain specific, right? So just separate domain specific versus chat GPT because chat GPT, what it has done is it has, it has just raised awareness that AI is important. Right now, we have to apply it to the domains. We have been talking like, an interesting thing in this case is that you start talking in like six months or one year, that becomes an old technology, old topic, 5G. And I'm not just talking 5G, I'm also talking 5G private networks now. So now soon we'll start talking about 6G. So when we look at you know uh, the, the progress that is going on, and a lot of times these are not technologies for the sake of new name and culture, but they bring a lot of use cases which are not possible because of the limitations Correct. of existing technology. Correct. They don't replace Wi-Fi or cellular, they complement them. Correct. So talk about what you're seeing for the next stage of 5G. Good question. So uh, the first thing is 5G is in full deployment now and it's gonna be there for the next five years, okay? A lot of it is open source enabled. Uh, and the biggest thing 5G brought was lower latency, IoT connectivity, and that allowed for new use cases like private networks, uh, connected cars, you know, things like that, right? Um, in 4G, we connected phones. In 5G, we connected things, okay? 6G, which is probably 2028 and after, although we're working on it right now, is focused primarily on uh, AI and how we can bring in AI to that, equation, okay? Uh, local learning, uh, local implementation, local uh, recovery, et cetera, et cetera. So that's already happening. People are already looking at it from, um, from a standards perspective, okay? Um, and, and that is gonna still continue r rapidly in terms of deployment, but does not, as you said, replace 5G. 5G is still in the process of being implemented, okay? When, when we look at all these technologies, I do remember the early days of Edge, you know, when you look at your cell phone, you can barely get anything done. Now you can get 5G when you're traveling LTE. Uh, and when you talk about 6G, of course, a few years ago, the US government's also released some bandwidth to further democratize it. I was thinking that by this time, all our laptops, they will have built-in chips, you know, so we just open the laptop, it doesn't, you don't have to worry about connecting to Wi-Fi or something. When we look at 6G or when you look at the future of connectivity, every, cars, they have built in, you know, uh, cellular. So talk a bit about 6G, not just from the perspective of technology, but the usage, how deeply it will go into our lives. So I think irrespective of 6G, I think uh, what there, there is, the way you always connect is, you know, cheapest, fastest, first, and everything else second, okay? Why do you have so much, uh, so many different alternatives for storage, right? Large storages are cheap, but they're slow. Fast storage, like flash and all, very fast, but expensive, right? Networking and connectivity is no different, okay? Wi-Fi, because of how it's set up, and if you can, would be the first choice. Unless, because spectrum is expensive, right? You're using shared commodity, right? Or shared 
uh, pr premium shared resources. Uh, so that's always the case. Now, where we have, where we are going, is actually very good because there is the 3GPP route, which is 5G, 6G, you know, the standard spectrum, which is allocated and every country does differently, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it's a good, you know, all the spectrum and contiguous spectrums are good. So we've, that's one path. And that's global macro connectivity. We also launched an umbrella called LF connectivity, right? Which was uh, through uh, help of Meta. But there are three projects there, more coming. But there's an interesting, the, the reason we launched LF connectivity about six months ago is to provide alternate connectivity access in areas which are challenged for this exact reason. So 60 gigahertz, there's a project called Teragraph that would connect fixed wireless access, remote rural access, or very dense urban access with buildings, right? And it's in deployment in many cities today, right? Um, CBRS says, is the other one, right? Like spectrum available on that. There are unlicensed technologies. So there's different ways. If you don't count ethernet and fiber and all the other fixed, wire, fixed technologies, right? So that's, that's, you have a basket of connectivity technologies. And the way you use it is the most premium uh, shared would be the last one. The free accessible is the first one. And what we do is we make the handoff and the interoperability very easy. Arpit, thank you so much for taking time out today as usual and talk about a wide range of topics. You know, I love talking to you, so I am already looking forward to our next conversation, but I really appreciate your time today. And thank you for throwing in unscripted questions, all of them. <laughs> thank you very much.